Welcome back to this week's episode of Mindset Rx. I'm your host, Dr. Robin McKay, and this is your place to be. If you're an emotionally intelligent leader who's ready to set the tone for a positive, productive, and purposeful, I'll just say one word, life, life. And that includes everything from work to home to family to your legacy. And I'm so happy to be here with you today. This is a very popular topic, judging from the response I received when I announced this as an event on my weekly LinkedIn Live. And it's something that I'm really excited to dig in with you today to kind of get some solutions to this problem. The title of our show today is Alternatives to Downsizing Your Career or Downshifting Your Career. And I think this is such an important topic now during the great resignation, the great reshuffle, the great awakening to be able to have this conversation about something that I have found in my research on gifted and talented girls and women that's been in that that realm for, for years for me now. We wrote about it in my book, Smart Girls in the 21st Century. And even before that, long before that, there has been research evidence to show that gifted women in particular are most likely to downsize or downshift their career aspirations because of all of the other stuff that's going on in their lives. And it actually starts happening pretty early on, like when they're in, when we're in undergrad, the first time a woman gets a C on an exam, for example, is the moment where she starts compromising her aspirations and says, well, maybe I'm not quite cut out to be an engineer or a physician or whatever the aspiration was. Boys, on the other hand, and men will generally blame their C's and their poor grades in college on their professors. And girls tend to blame their poor grades on themselves. So there's something wrong with them. So this starts early on. I've talked about the imposter syndrome before and today, this episode was inspired by uh, an article that I read in Harvard Business Review. And just for our purposes today, I'm going to read the summary for you, and then we'll link the, the entire article in the show notes as well. But here's the summary of this, this Women in the Workplace report, which was conducted by LeanIn.org, which is Sheryl Sandberg's organization and McKenzie and Company. This was in the October 13th, 2021 Harvard Business Review, and it was written by Marianne Cooper. The title of it is Research. Women leaders took on even more invisible work during the pandemic. Like that's a shocker. All right, so let's read the summary here. In the new 2021 Women in the Workplace report by LeanIn.org and McKinsey Company found that the mission critical work of supporting employees' well-being and promoting DEI, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. I know I totally misspoke that. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Those are the three, those are the three letters. Uh, is being done disproportionately by women who aren't being rewarded or recognized for it. Companies are reaping great rewards from these efforts, but compared to men in similar roles, women leaders are more likely to be exhausted and chronically stressed at work. Alarmingly, more than half of the women leaders who manage teams say that over the last few months, they have felt burned out at work often or almost always. And almost 40% of them have considered downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce altogether. And only about a quarter of the employees say that the extra time that they're doing is formally recognized either a great deal or a substantial amount. With women leaders experiencing sky high burnout and many of them eyeing the door, more needs to be done so that their efforts are treated like indispensable work instead of like an after hours do good or volunteer drive. Hofta manya, that's a lot. And if you know me, if you've been around with me for a while now, you know that I have a fierce, fierce protection of women in the workplace and have been a huge advocate of making sure that women are being recognized and valued in the workplace. 
And I think that as I read that article in the Harvard Business Review, what I reflected on were the recommendations that the, the research study had put forth. And it's not surprising necessarily, and I think it is an important part of the conversation, but a lot of the recommendations came from an institutional or organizational change. So rather than and I'm stopping here for a second because I wanna just say this in the, in the right way, rather than putting the onus and responsibility on the women themselves, what the researchers are suggesting is that we need institutional organizational transformation so that this kind of work gets recognized because right now what's happening is that we continue to have a leaky women in leadership pipeline primarily in STEM fields, I think, but in, probably at this, in this case, in all fields. And I agree. I think that the onus should be on the institutions to make an effort to transform how they are viewing the work that is largely unseen or un, unpaid for by women. The problem is this, in my experience, that institutional organizational change takes a long time, a long time. There are processes, there are procedures. And the truth of it is, in my experience, that it's always rigged for the house. So the organization itself is always going to benefit more from our efforts than we are from the organization. I know that's hard to hear because I know that we like to think that we're rewarded for our effort. I know that we like to think that it's a mutual um, reciprocal relationship. I give and I receive in my organization, but I've been, this is not my first rodeo. It's probably not if you're listening to this podcast, your first rodeo either. The fact of the matter is that I think women in particular, women leaders in particular in the workplace often come up short in terms of what we receive for the effort, for the energy, for the focus, for the commitment to our organizations. So having said that, I'm not saying that organizational change isn't needed. Absolutely it is. We've talked for a couple of years now about dismantling um, systems and structures that are no longer beneficial or of service to women, people of color, anybody who's not cisgendered, white, male, Christian in the workplace. But since that change takes so long, the conversation I want to have with us today in the Mindset Rx is before you downshift, and I don't blame you if you want to, listen, this is, it's been hard. This last few years in particular has been very hard on women. And I think that was the, the crux of the research in the Harvard Business Review is just to say how hard this time has been, particularly on leaders who take up the slack, women leaders in particular, who take up the slack, who take up the, the mantle for transformation, for change. It's been hard and it's exhausting and you probably are burned out. A lot of the women leaders who work with my company are burned out. That's one of the reasons that they come to me. Some of them are thinking about downshifting. Some of them already have downshifted. Some of them are thinking about leaving organizations altogether and going out on their own and doing something different. So what I want to talk with you about today is not the organizational transformation, which we all acknowledge needs to happen, but it's the inner transformation. It's the individual transformation that I want to talk with you about before you downshift, before you make the decision to quit your job, before you make your decision to give up your team that you've been leading for the last two years and go back, go back, I'm using air quotes here, but go back to being an individual contributor before you do that. I want you to think about a couple of things first. And I say this from the perspective of having worked with women leaders for a long time who have been in positions of burnout and who want to continue to contribute but can't see the way forward because they're so exhausted and because things have gone sideways over the past couple of years, things that we couldn't have predicted or controlled have really continued to, to impact how we're able to contribute in the workplace. 
so I've watched this happen professionally to others. And I've also had the experience of downshifting my own career early on. There have been periods in my life where I was burned out. And my go-to solution for my burnout was not more self-care, not more work-life balance, not more introspection. But instead it was like, I'm, I'm burning everything down. I'm shutting everything down. I'm getting out of the volunteer work I'm doing. I'm not taking on any more projects. It was just kind of this all or nothing approach to what amounts to managing my energy. And the truth of it for me was I had such bad boundaries around my work. I said yes to everything. I was pretty agreeable at that time in my life. And I wanted to be helpful. And I wanted to be known as somebody who would go the extra mile. I wanted to be known as somebody who was willing to go to the mats for a project. I loved that, in fact. And yet I didn't have any kind of sense of myself for what, what actually made sense for me based on what my deepest, most precious hopes and dreams are, what my deepest heart's desires were. So I just kept on giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and giving and over giving and saying yes until I was so depleted that the only thing left for me to do, it seemed, was to downshift. Give up everything. Start over. I'm going to quit my job. I used to say, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to go work at the Nordstrom counter. I'm going to go work at the Chanel counter at Nordstrom. Right? Maybe you have a fantasy about that too. I know a physician I worked with one time said she wanted to quit and go work at Whole Foods. So our brains come up with these seriously ridiculous solutions of quitting everything, of burning everything down, of starting over, of, oh, and here's another one. I'm going to go back to school. That's always a good one, right? Or I need to get a divorce, go back to school and build a house at the same time, as even though I'm burned out, even though I'm thinking about downshifting. So we keep adding more to our lives more to our responsibilities, our duties, and our obligations. So hopefully I've set the tone here for what we're, gonna, what we're gonna talk about in terms of what to think about before you downshift. And if you've already downshifted, if you've already resigned, if you've already made those decisions, it's okay. We can work with you here as well. When a woman leader comes to me and she says she's burned out, she's thinking about quitting her job or she's thinking about downshifting her career into an individual contributor role from a leadership role, for example, or thinking about somehow just transforming her career, even though she might not use those words. One of the first things we have to do is look at burnout. And the reason, I know it seems obvious, but the reason I start there is because unless and until you cure the burnout, you're going to be making all of your decisions from a very depleted, deprived, cynical, frustrated, angry place. So any response you have or any decision that you make from a place of burnout, I mean, my dad always says, make your decision the right decision. So I'm not saying go back and change your mind about anything. I'm just saying that if you're in a place of I'm thinking about this before you decide, let's get you feeling better. Let's elevate your well-being so that when you feel better, you can make a decision from a healthy perspective rather than from an unhealthy perspective. Now, I'm not saying that you have to, if you're in a toxic workplace, if you've got an abusive boss, if there's something going on that's unethical or you know misaligned from what you hold precious and dear, that's a different conversation. But if you're thinking about leaving your job or downgrading your, your, prof your professional development in order to somehow be able to take a breath, then 
that's a different part of the conversation, isn't it? So we've got to get you feeling at least a little bit better, at least a little bit better so that you're thinking clearly and so that you know that your decision is really aligned with your values, really aligned with what your soul's purpose is. And that, to be honest, in the last couple of years, what I have seen coming out of the pandemic is major existential conundrum. I'm not going to let it raise to the level of crisis, although sometimes it does. But the existential conundrums that women find ourselves in, is this all there is? If this is all there is, this really sucks. And I want something different. What's the purpose of my life, you ask? What am I here for? What am I meant to contribute? And if you find your job that you're in right now, your position that you're in right now, unfulfilling, then that is a signal that it probably is time to look for something that is aligned with what your soul's purpose is. And by the way, if you're new to my community and you don't like talking about souls, we're going to probably not, you're going to probably bump up against some of the things that I say around soul purpose, around spirituality in the workplace. And that's cool. I'm just probably not the right person for you to be listening to. But if you are, as most of you are, who are listening, emotionally intelligent, understanding that you actually do have a soul purpose and it's different from what you might have imagined when you were younger or what you experienced earlier in your career. And when you come to a place and you're in that existential crossroads, when you start feeling better, when you start recovering from burnout and you start making the decision, I don't want you to recover from burnout and then only to go back to the work that you've been in that's burned you out in the first place. That's just stupid. It's also probably the definition of insanity, right? To do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. So we want to get you feeling better so that you can make an informed decision. The trap here is that if I feel better, then I'll just go back and keep doing what I was doing. And I can do that until infinity. But instead of that, elevating your mental, emotional, spiritual, physical well-being to the place where now you can step out in an empowered way and say, you know what? listen, I want to go find a startup and work for a startup who's doing really exciting work in the world to save the planet, to scrub the air, to create the new world. I want to go do that instead of this thing over here that I've been doing for the last 15 years over and over and over and over again. I want to get out of this system. I don't want to dismantle the system I want to abandon it. That's a legit decision based on you feeling your best and making a decision from an empowered, centered place rather than from a depleted, wounded, I'm on my last leg position. Do you see the difference? I know you do. So we're talking today again, about what to do before you downshift your career. I think too that if you're thinking about leaving before you do, I want you to also really deeply consider linking arms with somebody like me who is an experienced advisor and executive coach for leaders. And here's why. The the world that we're pressing into, this new chapter of the world that we're creating, that we're writing, is not the same chapter that we were just in. It's not the same chapter that says grit, tenacity, and hard work are going to get you to the top. It's not the same chapter that says that you have to do it all all by yourself. It's not the same chapter that says, if I express my emotions, if I raise my hand and say, I'm burned out, if I raise my hand and say, I need a mental health day, you're not considered weak. If I cry at work, I'm not considered weak. It's not a ding on my brand. 
Those are the old chapters and those chapters are complete. So we're writing a new chapter now and on into the future. And that new chapter looks way more like this is a collaborative effort. I know that I'm not meant to, to walk this leg of my journey by myself. I know that there are things that I don't know. I know that there are people who have expertise in transformation that I have no idea about. I know that I'm a natural leader, but even natural leaders can be refined. And even deep down, I know that there's nothing especially wrong with me. And I want to stop focusing on thinking that there's something wrong with me. I want to focus on my strengths. I want to create work where I'm in flow. I want to recalibrate my relationship with time, with money, with work. Those are the things that we're moving into. Those are the, the practices and the mindsets and the attitudes and the experiences that we are writing in this new chapter. But the thing about downsizing or even resigning before you've embarked on this inner work, this inner journey to creating something new for yourself, if you, if you choose to just pull the plug without doing any inner work, the likelihood of you rec recreating or replicating your current experience is quite great. There's that old saying, wherever you go, there you are. So rather than recreate the wheel, rather than jump out of one gerbil wheel and jump onto another gerbil wheel because it's so familiar, why not take just a little bit of space? Eight weeks, 12 weeks, six months to do the deeper inner work first, to press pause on the decision to leave and make sure you're right inside, you're aligned inside before you do. The image just came into my mind of if you've got a broken leg and you have a flight scheduled, a, a jump flight scheduled to jump out of, a hel uh, out of an airplane a parachute, but you've got a broken leg, you probably want to mend the broken leg before you get on the plate. Otherwise, there's a whole catastrophe waiting for you on the other side of that jump. Big message today, heal inside. Heal the corporate trauma. Transform the burnout. Learn how to say no and mean it. There are some people who say no very easily. If you're not one of those people, it's time you learn. You're never going to be considered a big jerk because you're too nice. You're too kind. The truth is that it's really hard to be a good leader and be kind, be really, really nice. But you can learn how to say no and mean it and let your yes be yes and your no be no so that those, those times when you do find yourself overgiving, you can, you can walk that back and say, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but no, but you have to, it's not just learning that. I know that intellectually know that, but we have to also embody it. We also have to embed it in our consciousness, like a new program. We've got to download the new program that says, I'm going to stand in my no and ask, how can we make this work? and ask different questions other than just an automatic yes to whatever's right in front of me. So do your inner work first, press pause. And I, the last thing I will leave you with is this, is that there is this great temptation, I think, that there are some people who are wired for entrepreneurship and there is that desire to make the leap from corporate into entrepreneurship. Certainly I did that years ago and have worked with other people to make that exit, to generate an exit strategy and implement it, to move out of corporate and into an entrepreneurial position. 
Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. And I know that there are other solutions other than downgrading your career or downshifting your career. In other words, I don't want you to lose the traction, to lose the ground you've gained just because you're tired. But that doesn't mean you keep doing the same thing over and over again, does it? It's more about how can we shift things for you so that you can retain your position or even promote your position so that you're actually doing less and being more. So you reach a certain point in your career where even if you are in a leadership position, you might still be running on individual contributor energy, individual contributor programs, if you will. So I had to work really hard to get here. I'm going to keep working hard. I'm going to keep being the doer in the organization, even though I'm assigned leadership, I keep doing. So there's a whole bunch of skills that you have to develop as a leader. But one of the most important ones, it's not even a skill so much, it's a decision. And that decision is to let go of that individual contributor mindset, psychology, practice, behavior that got you into that leadership position. That's an inner transformation. Nobody can do that for you. But think about it. If all of those p women in the research study that I was referring to at the beginning of our time together, if all of those women were, and I'm making some assumptions here, I know I am, but go with me on this. If all of those people or even the vast majority of those people are in leadership positions, but they're still operating in the individual contributor mindset, attitudes, practices, energies, it's no wonder they're burned out because they have never been taught, they don't know that practicing presence over problem solving is probably the more effective leadership style. They don't understand, nobody's taught them, nobody's ever said this to them, that it's who you be when you're a leader, not what you do as a leader. They've met, never been trained to understand that just because you feel an emotion doesn't mean it's yours and you are not designed or equipped or capable actually of processing another person's emotions. Even though you care and even though you want to, you're not capable of it. It's like putting diesel fuel in a gas engine. So yes, this is a systemic problem. Yes, this is an organizational challenge. Of course it is. But for those of us women who are in leadership right here, right now, the best thing I believe in my experience that we can do is learn how to lead ourselves very, very well. And make decisions from the healthiest, most whole position that we can and we do that by engaging professionals, experts, who are more than capable of leading you into the most actualized version of yourself. Then if you decide to leave, you know you're doing it for the right reasons. You know you're doing it for the aligned reasons not because you're so exhausted you can't get out of bed, although that is a pretty good indicator that something's got to shift, isn't it? All right, so I'm gonna close there for today. This is a conversation that I have pretty regularly with my private executive clients, with my Actualization Academy that I'm starting soon. This is gonna be part of the work that we do. I've always said that the best way to actualize your deeply held goals and dreams is to become the version of yourself who already has them. And so I'm excited to announce that later this spring, we're going to be opening the doors to the McKay Academy of Actualization for intuitive and intelligent leaders who are ready to create 
the next chapter of their lives and the new world that we are pressing into even as we speak. So stay tuned for more of that. If you would love to get on the waiting list to get announcements and notifications about the process and what we're doing behind the scenes with that, we'll leave the link in the show notes, but the URL is drrobinmckay.com forward slash waitlist. And if you found this episode helpful, I would love it if you would leave a comment. If you're listening to the podcast, leave a review. I always appreciate that and take a screenshot of it. Share it on social media and tag me in it so I can say thank you. And until next time, I'm Dr. Robin McKay, and I wish you the best week. <laughs>